Welcome to the Tanya Acker Show. Michigan Supreme Court Justice Kira Harris Bolden is here. She is the first Black woman to serve on the Michigan Supreme Court. She's also someone who took a tragedy and an injustice and used it to inspire her to make the history that she did and to make justice more real for everyone. Here I am with Justice Kira Harris Bolden. Welcome to the podcast, Justice Bolden. It is such an honor to have you here on my show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. You are certainly a history maker. You are Michigan's first Black woman Supreme Court justice. You are also its youngest. It is a story of positivity that inspires many of us, uh, regardless of the packages in which we are. Uh, in which we are. Uh, you are an inspiration. As I understand it, the story that inspired you to pursue the career that you have uh, really reflects a darker moment in this country's uh, history. Tell us about that, if you would, please. I had the great fortune of having my great-grandmother with me until I was in college. And when people get up in age, they start sharing uh, recipes and family stories and, and family history. And she told me the story of my great-grandfather, Jesse Lee Bond, who was lynched in Tennessee in 1939 after requesting a receipt from a store owner. A lynch mob ensued, and he was beaten and castrated and thrown into the local river, and the coroner deemed it an accidental drowning. And as a result, his murderers walked free. I was on my way to getting my psychology degree, which I actually did because I was so late in my uh, senior a uh, year, um, I didn't want to change majors. Uh, so I got a degree in psychology and in English, but I really felt compelled to be a part of the justice system. Uh, so again, I had no uh, plan to be an attorney, but I wanted other families to see justice in a way that my family did not see justice. And I wanted to be a part of that change and, and instill trust and build trust in our justice system. Two things strike me about that story, Justice Bolden. One, uh, you mentioned that that lynching, your great-grandfather's lynching, took place in 1939. That was two years after my mother was born. So mm. I, I think it's important to put these things in context, that that history of violence is not so, you know, we're not talking about Harriet Tubman days. The second thing that really strikes me, Justice Bolden, is that you didn't learn this part of your family history until what? You said you were in college? You were a psychology major? I was, in, I was major? in college, and it was later in my college career. Um, I've grappled with this. Um, I, my grandmother is still living. She was actually at my appointment announcement. I feel like a lot of people don't know this family history, much because it's been lost through the generations. But those that are aware, I feel like there's a sense of shame um, that, that comes from these stories or a sense of fear that telling these stories will uh, receive backlash. And I think that it's an important story to tell because we've made so much progress in this country, but we still have a very long way to go. And I'm also thinking, you know, that it just reactivates trauma. I mean, I'm thinking about what it must have been for your great-grandmother to relive that agony uh, and, and pass it on to the next generation, or I guess in your case, two generations down. When you heard that, what was going on in your head? Were you surprised? Were you shocked? Like, what were you feeling in the moment? You know, I was amazed. I was amazed for a few different reasons. How my family has endured over the years because of this, this, this tragedy. You, there are so many other things um, that, are, that is going on other than uh, loss of life necessarily, which is a very important part of it. But that meant my grandmother didn't have a father. That means potentially money and economic growth. We talk about generational wealth. Well, it's really hard to have generational wealth when your family members have been unjustly killed. And so it, it just has so many generational impacts. And so really, I was just amazed at how my family has endured and so many other families across this nation, because we have to remember during that time, especially in, in the South, uh, 
government sanctioned injustice was a uh, common and how many families have endured through all of this. And so I felt a sense of pride in my family that they have endured such tragedy and still have been able to provide me with the life that I've been able to have and provide me with the opportunities to even be a justice on the Michigan Supreme Court. It's all because of the support I've been able to have. And so obviously sad, tearful, um, but also just a great sense of, uh, of pride and how we've endured. You're being modest when you say how we've endured. I mean, if you think about the power of that story, your great grandfather was murdered and there was no justice. And from the memory of that story, here comes you, the first black woman to sit on the Michigan Supreme Court, the youngest Michigan Supreme Court justice. The murder was absolutely horrible. I don't want to give it short shrift, but I can't think of a better historical reckoning than you being where you are right now. I think there are a whole lot of ancestors from a whole lot of families uh, who are cheering for you right now. Let's talk a little bit about your path. So you decide, you know, I'm going to go to law school. I want to make a difference uh, in, in this field uh, that really failed my family in the past. You say, I want to make a difference. I'm doing this series called The Art of Our Wars, and I really want to look at how people who have won, you know, people who have survived conflict and overcome conflict did that. And certainly, law school is no easy feat. I have no doubt that there were some challenges along the way, either law school, your professional career, being where you are now. Uh, is there a conflict or a moment of conflict that you can think of that really helped define or shape where you are right now? I would say with my particular journey in being from Michigan and practicing in the Detroit area, I had the benefit of having Black judges and Black lawyers really wrap their arms around me and make sure um, that they were leading me and guiding me and making sure that I was successful. So I think I avoided a lot of pitfalls that I think other people would because I had that representation. I was a judicial law clerk for the longest serving Black judge in the state of Michigan's history. And he poured into me and mentored me and showed me what it was like to be a judge, to have judicial temperament, to be courteous to all litigants. Um, I then worked for Lewis and Monday as a civil litigator, which is the oldest and largest Black-owned law firm in the country. I received great mentorship, but I think representation had a lot to do with it and people really wanting me to succeed. Um, so I am so, so, so thankful of that because it is really hard to have a career, especially as a Black person with people that look like you. Uh, black lawyers make up now, a new study came out, less than 5% of attorneys nationally. In Black women, you're talking about less than 3%, right? So I have been very, very fortunate. But what I will say is that, of course, me being in particular spaces is always going to irritate and create new experiences for individuals, I'll say. For people that have never met someone like me that will wear their natural hair to their job for someone to be young, and I present younger than I am. So um, there has been conflict along the way. But I, what I will say is I have a very, very low tolerance for negativity. <laughs> and that has really helped me. You know, sometimes people make certain assumptions about young looking folks. They make assumptions about black looking folks and they make assumptions about women. When you put all of those things together, you know, people might assume that you are not as smart as you are, not as capable as you are. And then if you're too smart, maybe you're a little arrogant or uppity, like it's a, it's a delicate, sometimes it can be a real, uh, a real dance that one has to do. Uh, Talk to us about what your techniques are for saying, you know what, I don't have time for this. I got to go hear cases. I mean, I know at some point, you know, right, we're all human. It's got to bother you sometimes. Uh, how do you move past it? I would say when I decided to run for state representative, I was presented with all of those challenges with community leaders telling me I was too young or too inexperienced to run for state representative, to represent my hometown, to represent 90,000 people. I just couldn't do it. What was important to me is just, just to always 
let myself show through my work. I always tell people, and I don't say it in an arrogant manner, it's just fact, I will outwork anybody. Uh, and <laughs> that's just how I endure. And a lot of people that have been naysayers through my work ethic, I have been able to change their opinions and thought processes of, of me, um, the stereotypes that they may think of me. I won my, my first campaign in my primary with five opponents with 45% of the vote. And I was told uh, I couldn't do it. Again, I was too young, too inexperienced, but my community thought otherwise. And that's just because I worked hard. I worked hard as a state legislator, got five bills passed into law. A lot of people didn't think I would be able to, to do that. So for me, I know my work ethic. I know that I'm capable. I know that I'm worthy. And so that's what just keeps me focused on the work and shuts and I can shut out all the noise. Speaking of noise, there's a whole lot of it these days, you know, more than ever justice, right? So young people, not even just young people, everybody, like we hear all of these voices. We see any type of negativity that anybody is experiencing anywhere in the world is just a click away. And we see it, we are uh, immersed in it. And a lot of folks say things like, you know, we are just going down the tubes. These are the worst days ever. Things will never get any better. Your story belies that. But you tell me and you tell us rather, what's your reaction, you know, when you hear that? I mean, we are drowning in a sea of anger and mad. Do you think that we're on an upswing? And if you do, how do we better communicate that and make it meaningful for people? For me, I have never shied away from people that want to critique my performance or share a different opinion than me. Again, I've spent years in the legislature where there were people that were very opposed to uh, some of the bills that, that I would introduce. My, again, my work ethic, I think, would shine through, but my ability to listen to people even when their opinions differed from mine Sharing my personal story, I think, really helped break barriers. For example, I have shared my story on the House floor about my miscarriage in 2019 and how I suffered from uterine fibroids um, and had to have a myomectomy. And while these issues may not necessarily resonate with everyone, I had so many men come up to me and tell me my wife suffered from a miscarriage. And that allowed for conversation. So me sharing my story has really, um, and having people get to know me, for me, has really uh, lessened the negativity um, from people that you would think would be very, very negative towards me. And I always do that. I share my stories. I let people get to know me so we can have a conversation because you can change hearts and minds uh, with conversation. You can't be afraid of it. And I never have shied away from it. Uh, tough conversations with individuals. So I think that we're on an upswing, or we, at least we can be, <laughs> but we really have to uh, listen to each other. And we're not always going to agree, and that's okay, but we have to, to listen. That I, I think that's really spot on, Justice, right? Because the only way we're on an upswing is if there are enough different types of voices at the table so we can really know who we all are and not simply react to these caricatured versions of one another. What were the circumstances that led you to sh uh, share the story of your miscarriage on the, on the uh, legislative floor? What a, what a personal and painful story to, to have to share so publicly. What led to that? Well, it, I had a miscarriage at the beginning of my legislative career, um, literally going into it my first days and months of, in the legislature, I was experiencing a, mix, a miscarriage. And I had to go through m my new job, smiling, acting like there was nothing wrong. And I felt also alone. I felt um, like nobody would understand. And so for me, I've just decided to share my story so that other women would know how common it was. I didn't know. When I experienced it, it felt very isolating. So I just really wanted other women to know that it's common and that I was somebody that experienced this, even though I was experiencing what one would call success as being a legislature and being a legislator. Uh, we all go through things. And so it was very important for me to share that. I think of women lawyers. Um, I clerked for a judge and my co-clerk 
was pregnant when she started our clerkship. And since the judge had an open room in her chambers, uh, she put a baby crib in there. My co-clerk's nanny came for lunch. And so there was, a, I started my legal career. Um, I'm, a, I'm child-free by choice, but I started my legal career saying, of course you can have a baby in a conference room. <laughs> like, it's not a big deal. Do you think that the legal profession, uh, litigation in particular, because litigators got to get called to go to court sometimes at a moment's notice, um, have to get up to speed on tricky things really quickly if they're in contentious litigation. Do you think that the legal profession has become more accommodating of mothers in particular? Not just women, but I mean mothers, people who are uh, raising young humans. I think we still have a long way to go. So I have a seven-month-old at home, and so I am very, very... You have uh, lots of free time, right? I know. A whole so lot much, of free time. So much free time. <laughs> I'm twiddling my thumbs, um, trying to figure out what to do. I think through my service, there's a lot that we can do at the Michigan Supreme Court level to make sure that new mothers uh, or mothers and parents in general are accommodated. But for in Michigan, from what I have seen, uh, we have a little bit of a ways to go uh, with that. I know that women have been doing their best, and we really need to have more accommodations. What's your advice to young people who want to pursue a career in law? You know, I, I think that a lot of the times people have a lot of misperceptions about what it is, right? Like they think that most of the day is dashing into court and, you know, charming a jury. That's a misperception, even for litigators. That's not uh, most, that's not what most of that's not what most litigators do on a regular basis. What advice do you give to young people who are dazzled by the prospect of a career in law? Yeah, well, you're 100% uh, correct. Most of your day will consist of reading and writing, <laughs> motions, briefs, and talking to your clients part of the time. Uh, you're in court, even as a litigator, not as much in comparison to those three other things. My suggestion, my advice would be if someone is in a particular field of law that interests you, shadow them. Ask if you can volunteer. Ask if you can help. I know that a lot of focus is on money these days, and I know that people, some people can't afford to work for free. But I believe that it will save you so much more time, energy, and money down the line because you'll know what you don't want to do at the very least. So that is the advice I like to give to people. Shadow someone, volunteer with someone, and see if that is the work that you want to do. Just live a day in the life. You'll know very quickly if you, if you want to do that for the rest of your life. <laughs> here, here. Speaking of money and time, um, I, Justice, personally believe that too many people go to court too quickly. I think that they believe it's going to be quicker, less expensive. I think they believe that truth will ultimately out if they just hang in there. I think a lot of folks just pull the trigger, the court trigger too quickly without employing other mechanisms. Uh, do you think I'm right or wrong about that? So in some cases, yes, some some disputes could be resolved with a conversation, <laughs> right? If it's driven by emotion and feelings, then you'll probably be, be in it for a, a lot longer uh, than you need to be. And that's pro mostly on the civil side, right? On the criminal side, you know, I believe everybody deserves their day in court. So if you want to fight it to the end, uh, you have every right and, to do so if it means the loss of your freedom. So on the civil side, you know, probably more conversations, maybe mediation could, could be more beneficial for people. I think that folks just sometimes don't appreciate how long it'll take. Like right now, I bet Justice, somebody in Michigan is involved in some, you know, embroglio with somebody and they're like, you know what? There is a really smart Michigan Supreme Court justice. My case is gonna get to her. If you're just now starting your fight, friend, your case will get to her in, what, 10 years? Maybe. So she's still going to look like this. <laughs> She'll still be young looking, but it's going to be 10 years down the road. It'll be a minute. And I think um, that's an important point, too. Even at the Supreme Court level, very few people or very few entities can appeal as of right. So a lot of people think that they'll get to us when really we take about 2% of all the cases that are filed if they get through the Court of Appeals. So uh, it, it's, it's less expensive and less timely if you can try to resolve it yourself, definitely. 
like the United States Supreme Court. I mean, you look at all these cases, a bunch of petitions, and you don't take all of them. You take the ones what, where the law is maybe on the fence. You've got to clarify you know, something important, a, a grand injustice. You don't just take any case that somebody wants to appeal to you. Before we go, Justice Bolden, you've got a seven-month-old, you've got a big career, you've made a lot of history. When I talk to people who've done incredible things, I just had a conversation with uh, Kameen Samuels, the Navy's first black woman helicopter pilot. And I was like, what does your history mean? You know, what is the history that you made mean to you? It really means something to me. And modestly, I had to like pull an answer out of her. And I'm going to do the same to you. I'm going to drag an answer out of you because I know, I am sure, you don't go around saying, I am Michigan's first Black woman Supreme Court justice. I do not. Guess what I am? I am Michigan's first. <laughs> but so you're living your life. You know, for the rest of us, Black, white, Asian, uh, Latin, male, female, the fact that you are where you are, to me, is an important signal about where America is and is going and, you know, the, the direction in which history is moving. So what you've done is really, it's compelling. You know, it, it really means something to a lot of us. What does that history mean to you? Uh, and I'm going to really, if you don't think about it, think about it now. Like when you think about what you've done, what does that mean in your soul? So for me, first and foremost, why I decided to run for Michigan Supreme Court is because there had been no black woman on the Michigan Supreme Court. And that representation was really important to me because I never, one, I didn't want to look down at my daughter and ever tell her I did not do something. I did not take an opportunity because of her. So I ran my um, campaign last year pregnant with her and yeah, had her in the middle of the campaign and kept on running. Uh, But I didn't want my daughter or any children to grow up in a world where there had never been a black woman on the Michigan Supreme Court. Because I really believe it's hard to be what you cannot see. But once you see it, you can achieve it. So I have grown up in my whole adult life not seeing someone that looked like me on the highest court in the state of Michigan. And really, everyone has because there's never there's never been a black woman. But I just kind of thought this stopped with me. And the way that little boys and little girls look at me, especially the ones that look like me, it's, it's an incredible feeling for them to be so excited. Some of them, I walk into a room, they start screaming. They treat me like I'm a rock star. But I, that's how I want them to view themselves. And so it's important for me to not just be on the Michigan Supreme Court as a Black woman, as a black woman but I go to schools, I go to after-school programs, I try to read, I try to meet young people so that they know that they can do it too. And I think that obviously I'm very good at my job. I'm go- like I said, I'm going to outwork everybody, but the representation piece is also so important. You cannot be what you cannot see. Justice Bolden, before we go, tell us what you do for fun with all of that extra spare time that I know you have. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. I, I just really enjoy hanging out with my baby. Uh, She changes every day. She has a very uh, funny personality now. So I hang out with her for fun. Other than that, I watch, uh, you know, The Bachelor and, you know, things like that to unwind. And uh, my mother is retired and she watches your show and she wanted Ah. to tell you that how much she loves you, by the way. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Wow. I'm so honored. I called her before this interview and I said, Ma, do you know Tanya I. Ecker? And she said, yeah. So she told me to tell you hi. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hi, Mom. I'm so honored. Look who you created. Thank you, Mom. Yes. I will uh, happily send her a picture or some swag or any such thing, yes, if you like. Yes, she would love that. Oh, my gosh. I'm so flattered that your mother likes me. Whew. Justice Kira Bolden, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you honor me with your time, and thank you for everything that you've done and that you're doing. Thanks for coming on the show, and I do hope you'll come back, Justice. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. 